let's jump into a lesson that I hope will be one of the most beneficial um, lessons as far as helping you understand overall through your scriptures the use of ancient code names and types. So let's start off but with a little bit of a review. We talked about classical prophecy being prophecies that were fulfilled historically and we talked about apocalyptic prophecy, prophecies of the end time. And we've been learning that classical prophets often chose what they said historically to also be a type of future apocalyptic prophecy as well. Um, they, what we're going to talk about right now is that they would use uh, countries, types, shadows, and symbols of things that were familiar to them. Mostly such world powers were contemporary with the prophet or were no longer the force that they once were but familiar to the prophet. So symbols such as ancient Egypt, Assyria, which would have been more of a type of a, of a terror uh, reign of a world conqueror. And Daniel would use Persia and Greece, things that were familiar in his day. Even though Daniel would be prophesying, the angel told him, of the end time, not of his day. Now Isaiah uses Assyria and Egypt. You remember that Assyria would take the ten northern tribes captive in Assyria's day, Israel was in in Isaiah's day. Israel was taken captive by Assyria, and Isaiah watched that happen and predicted that it would happen. And then he also showed that Assyria would go down in his day and also conquer Egypt. So these were two superpowers in Isaiah's day, and he will use those as types and shadow. Daniel will use Persia and Greek. They're familiar to him as the superpowers in his day. And then John the Revelator. <clears throat> we'll choose Babylon as well, but Babylon was not a world power in John's day. It was, um, it had taken place hundreds of years before the time of John. So clearly John was using a type that previous prophets had used um, so that he could predict something in the end time with a, with a symbol that would be familiar. Ancient names of nations lose their relevance when those nations no longer exist. So when we try to take ancient names and place them today on a map and try and relate what they were saying about the place anciently to today, we, we can get confused. The prophet's visions of the future reflect the nation's ancient roles as major world powers, not the roles, if any, of their modern namesakes. So if we try to identify modern Egypt again with modern Iraq or Babylon, for example, they're, they're not going to be proper types. They were talking about the world powers in their day. Prominent names in prophecy identify the major, not the lesser world powers. So we're gonna take a little bit of a look at this. This is Egypt today, and this is modern Iraq today. And, the, and while because Hebrew prophecy is multi-dimensional and, and on many levels, there might be some geographical um, explanations today that's not the type that the prophets were using. So let's, again, a nation's role, not the name, is the important thing. Such as, and this is surprising, but we talked about in the last lesson that the, a world power from the north is a big deal. That's a consistent um, symbol through the prophets. And a single end time world power from the north is intimated both in apocalyptic as well as the classical historical prophecies. Ancient names are code names of end time world powers. And we're gonna take a close look at that today so that you can see that that is what Isaiah is doing. I, it, I believe with all of my heart, if, if, if I sit and tell you something or if anybody else gives you their idea of Isaiah, that's their opinion. What you need to do is you need to decide if Isaiah was doing this. And so for that reason, we're going to be taking a look at Egypt and Assyria in the text of Isaiah extensively today. All right, so some of the ancient names that are used as code names. Daniel used the king of the north as the end time bad guy. Isaiah will call him the king of Assyria. And Jeremiah will call him the king of Babylon. Future world powers resemble the ancient world powers in their roles that they play at the end time of the world. And of course, these guys 
um, will be represented with me. We, we, we actually, as a class, did a puppet show once of Isaiah, and uh, this was our King of Assyria puppet, and it's just take it with a grain of salt. It was meant to be fun. All right, we have other biblical code names for him. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the Old Testament prophets, they're not the only ones to use code names for particular characters. This end time bad guy, this apocalyptic antichrist, is the seed of the serpent in Genesis. He's the idol shepherd in Zechariah. The little horn of Daniel, the prince that shall come, the willful king. And in a few verses earlier um, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, he's called the vile person and a bloody and deceitful man in Psalms, adv our adversary, Destru destroyer of the Gentiles in Jeremiah, head of the northern army in Joel. And remember, he's our first mention of the day of the Lord. King of princes in Hosea, prince of Tyre in Ezekiel, the Assyrian in Micah. And then if we can go to the New Testament in Revelation, we have the beast, we have the false prophet, and to remember in 1 John, it's the Antichrist that we are familiar with and that we like to call him probably commonly today, doesn't mean Christ versus this guy. I mean, that, that might apply on one level, but anti means in place of. He comes in place of Christ, claiming to be the deliverer and the Messiah for the world. He is the lawless one. He's a man of sin. He's the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians, the prince of darkness in 1 Thessalonians, the fallen star, the unclean spirit, and there are many others. These are just a few of the terms that refer to him in scripture. The end of the world, the, a nutshell prophetic prop, a pattern. We kind of did this in our first lesson when we were doing chapters 1 and 2 and 34 and 35. There will occur a worldwide judgment and destruction of evil lures, resembling ancient scenarios of judgment and destruction. There will occur a complete deliverance and restoration of God's people, resembling partial scenarios of deliverance and restoration. Again, Ezra and Nehemiah didn't see a full fulfillment and restoration of the temple when they went, when they went back uh, to Jerusalem after their captivity in Babylon. As a matter of fact, they mourned that it was such a, a such a nothing in compared with the, the glory of Solomon's temple. And in Haggai, they're promised that in a future time, that temple will be more glorious than Solomon's temple. So many of these restoration prophecies are millennial in their nature. We also talked about how the destruction and the deliverance are two sides of the same coin. When we had the parting of the Red Sea, that was a great day for Israel. Not so good if you were the world's greatest power, the Egyptian army at that time. And the walls of Jericho, here you can see the Rahab um, and the red cord that she hung out of her window and the protection of her family during this destruction. All of these things are types of the end time. And these ones particularly because they both happened on the same day on the Hebrew calendar. This would have been the seventh day of unleavened bread just after the Passover. And these would be a Passover. We're going to see in Isaiah tonight another Passover that would happen in the future. The end time prophecies talk about a destruction and a restoration. God's people will be delivered from a worldwide destruction of evildoers and evil world powers. And God's people will receive permanent lands of inheritance and enjoy a millennial peace. And just from there, just from the permanent lands of inheritance, we learn that these are future prophecies. All right, I, I, if you know me, you know that I love biblical astronomy. I love to look in the stars and look at the names of the ancient stars and read the stories that are written in the sky. In Psalm 19, it says that God named the stars. He named them before the languages were confounded. And so you can look in all the different cultures and read ancient names of the stars. And they tell a story in the sky, not of hijacked astrology, which Satan did for our day. He uh, takes anything that's sacred and he'll hijack it and make it about you and me and whether or not we need to have a boyfriend today or tomorrow or, or what we need to do in our life. The stars were about the plan of redemption. They were God's story written in the sky anciently, and that would be the proper 
interpretation, and they're referred to in the Bible. So we're going to take a look really quickly at the story of Perseus and Andromeda. We're not going to go into the mythology or any of those uh, kind of twisted interpretations of what they meant anciently. We're just going to go to the names of the stars and find out what they say about those constellations. So in Andromeda, we find that she is weak. We find that she is afflicted, that she is struck down and broken down. Ancient names are the chained. She's the changed, chained woman, stretched out, and she's actually chained to a rock. And if you look in uh, at the screen down here, you can see Cetus. Cetus is the giant sea monster, and he's coming to eat or kill Andromeda. Now we have a similar, uh, a similar depiction of this in Isaiah chapter 51, where it says it's telling Zion, "Hear now this, thou afflicted, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion." Put on a beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, which is a word link, and ye shall be redeemed without money. So Zion is in trouble. There's a time of affliction in the last days. And enter on the scene, Perseus. Perseus the hero. Perseus translates directly into the Greek as from the Greek as the breaker, the breaker. What's he going to break? He's going to break the chains of Zion. He who lights and fights and, sub and subdues, he who helps, he who carries away, and he who breaks. And again, this is, this is one of those situations where it's a linking word that's kind of surprising. You wouldn't think that the breaker would be in scripture, but it is. Let's look at Micah chapter two. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee, I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra. Basra is Hebrew for a sheepfold. People be, being gathered into a sheepfold. We're gonna look more at that later. But as the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make a great noise by reason of the multitude of men and the breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and they have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. And so that's an end time prophecy in Micah about a breaker who comes and rescues Zion. So let's take a look at Cetus, the sea monster in this story in the sky. He has bands, bands that are attached to his neck and they are, they have on the end of those two bands, the two fish that we learned last time represent the house of Israel, both the northern tribes and Judah. And they actually were a prediction of their captivity by Assyria and Babylon if you overlay them on a map. But the interesting thing about bands is bands is its own constellation. It's, it's not just an addition to Cetus or an attachment to the fish. It is the bands. Um, Cetus is going to be pulling those fish into captivity, but Cetus is also after Andromeda. He's also after the bride and the princess in the sky. He um, is subdued. He's a sea monster and a whale, according to the names of the stars in this constellation. He is the rebel, and he is the bound or chained enemy. So he's the enemy of the she who is bound and chained. There are many scriptures that talk about the sea monsters in, this, in, in these ancient constellations. The fishes, Pisces, are bound to Cetus. The woman Andromeda is chained, but the deliverer of both is near. Notice that the band that binds the two houses of Israel to Cetus also unites those two houses of Israel. Behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. In that day, we learn that in that day is the day of the Lord. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, the piercing serpent, and Leviathan, the crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Psalm 74, for God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide, break, the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. And then again in Revelation, we saw that the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and he saw a beast coming up out of the sea. These are all images of the adversary in the sky, the opponent to God's plan. And he, in Revelation, is going to exercise his authority 42 months 
or three and a half years. We're going to see that prophecy, that, that length of time, this particular period of time in prophecy many, many times um, in other lessons. So, apocalyptic prophecy makes little, little predictions of the end of the world. Classical prophecy uses history as an allegory or type of the end of the world, but foreshadows the end by selectively depicting the ancient events. So we're going to look really quickly at King Ahaz, um, who was the father of King Hezekiah. We'll learn a lot more about them in the next lesson. But we're going to go back to 2 Kings. In the last lesson I said it was 1 Kings, but it's 2 Kings. And he, King Ahaz, followed the ways of the kings of Israel, even sacrificing his son in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations of the Lord that they had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burnt incense at the high places and on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. Now the question that we want to ask ourselves is why didn't Isaiah tell us what a bad guy King Ahaz was? Why didn't he make it more obvious that King Ahaz was involved in this kind of thing? Let's take a look at another scripture in 2 Kings about Ahaz. So Ahaz sent messengers to the king of Assyria saying, I am thy servant. Now, this is the king of Judah under covenant with God, pledging himself to the king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel because they in the north were in a coup to take out the king Ahaz and replace him on the throne with a puppet king, which rise up against me. So Ahaz, instead of trusting in God, to he he's going to hedge his bet by trying to make an alliance with the king of Assyria. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was in the house of the Lord and in the treasure of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. Okay, why didn't Isaiah include this part in the story? We're going to learn this story of, of Ahaz and King Hezekiah. Isaiah is going to contrast them with each other in Isaiah chapters seven and 6 and 7 and 8, well, it's mostly 7 and 8, and 37 and 38, and we're going to be looking at those next time. But the point that we're trying to make here is that Isaiah was selectively choosing what he told us about Ahaz and what he told us about Hezekiah so that what he said would also be a prediction of the end time. He didn't give us all the information, even that we could glean right out of the Bible. Assyria and Egypt function as code names of world powers in Zechariah's day as well. But the interesting thing about this is that the, um, in Zechariah's day, there was Assyria and Egypt were no longer a threat to Israel. And he is going to be using those types because he is building off of the prophecies of Isaiah and others that went before him. So in Zechariah, he says, I will bring them, meaning Ephraim and the leader of the tribes of the north, again out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon. Those were metaphors for the promised lands in the Old Testament. And place shall not be found for them. There, there's not enough room for all of those that will gather in this grand end time gathering. And notice that they gather from our end time superpowers that are in conflict with each other. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea and the depths of the river will dry up. We're about to review in a minute from our reading last time that the king of Assyria is called the river. He's the river in flood. He's the one in the end time that overfloods his borders and begins to attack the nations. The river will dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. So we're going to have to take a close look at the symbols of Assyria and Egypt in Isaiah's day so we can accurately figure out who they might represent in our day. Because all Hebrew prophecy builds upon itself, we can best understand Zechariah's prophecy about Assyria and Egypt in the light of what the former prophets like Isaiah had to say about them and how he had characterized them. They comprise the two major world powers of Isaiah's day. Isaiah's characterization of these nations is most pertinent to our definition because he will be who the others build on. Isaiah's Assyria. Let's take a look at, at, at how Isaiah depicts Assyria in his metaphor or his code name of this end time world power. 
It consists of an emergent militaristic power from the north. Again, there's that, that from the north. A law unto itself. It seeks to rule the world by enslaving all nations and taking over their lands. Each of these comes from different verses in Isaiah. He establishes a false peace at the time when the world is riping in wickedness. And he suddenly conquers and destroys all lands like a new flood in the day of Jehovah, or the day of the Lord. In Isaiah 28, verses 2 and 3, Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, which has a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand, be the left hand, we'll talk about that in a minute, the crown of pride and the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden underfoot. This, I'm going to take a little bit of a rabbit trail for a minute here because I, you know, I hear so much about when we look at DNC 85, there's one mighty and strong that comes in the last days. Pay attention, this is a bad guy. And the point that we need to make here is that in the scriptures, there are many mighty and strong ones. And, and we kind of take that prophecy out of context sometimes. In the teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith, he said, about this end time gathering of Israel in the dispensation of the fullness of times, this day of the Lord period, Moses sought to bring the children of Israel into the presence of God through the power of the priesthood. He tried to establish Zion, but he could not. In the first ages of the world, they tried to establish the same thing. There were Eliases raised up who tried to restore these very glories, but did not obtain them. But they prophesied of a day when this glory would be revealed. Paul spoke of the dispensation of the fullness of times, when God would gather together all things in one. And those men to whom these keys have been given, these gathering keys, will have to be there. And they without us cannot be made perfect. These men are in heaven, but their children are on earth, and their bowels yearn over us. God sends down men for this reason, and the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that give offense and them that do iniquity, in Matthew 13. Now this is my favorite part right here. All these authoritative characters will come down and join hand in hand in bringing about this work. And that would include Joseph Smith, because as he wrote, away from Nauvoo, he kept turning back because he wanted to see the completion of the temple and he knew that he would not. He, as much or more than any of the other prophets, yearned to see Zion established and that is future and there will be a grand symphony of prophets and angelic players on the scene for that grand finale. All right, so now we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at some words that we're gonna call metaphorical pseudonyms. So a pseudonym is a name that's not really your name, it's just a name that you're called by, and a metaphor is like when you compare it to something else. So we're gonna have names that are pseudonyms for the king of Assyria in the book of Isaiah, and you can actually link these names together through parallelisms in the Hebrew, and you will learn what you learn, a few of the names, you can link them to other names until you have a whole little dictionary of code names for the different characters. So let's start with the king of Assyria in um, Isaiah chapter 10, and that's why we read Isaiah 8 and 10 for this lesson, because there's a lot of code names for the king of Assyria in those lessons. Hail the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, he is a staff and my wrath in their hand. So here we see that the Assyrian is being used in parallel with a rod, with anger, with a staff, and with wrath in Isaiah 10. Now moving over to Isaiah 14, we'll see that the king of Babylon, which is just another type of this end time guy, is going to have a lot of these same characteristics. So this is how we can tie Assyria, king of Assyria in Isaiah and king of Babylon together as the same guy. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say, the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the rod 
of those who ruled, him who with unerring blows struck down the nations in his anger, who subdued people in his wrath. We learn so many things from this. For one, we learn that when the scriptures talk about God's wrath in the last days, it's not an angry God smashing everybody. No, it's a God, a just God, a loving God, who allows us our choice. And we choose this guy. The ascension of Isaiah says the whole world is deceived by him, except for the very elect. All right, so the king of Assyria, we're going to link again. So let's get that out of our way and put our linking up in the corner. The king of Assyria is associated in Isaiah with quaking. Here, we're going to take the code name of anger, and it's going to come in parallel with a hand. He is the Lord's hand. In Isaiah, he's his left hand, and we can run a bunch of scriptures together and, and link them and see that as well. But let's read this one. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is kindled against his people. He draws back his hand against them and strikes them. The mountains quake. Remember that mountains are also nations in Isaiah, and their corpses lie like litter about the streets. Is this the man? in Isaiah 5 and in Isaiah 14, who made the earth shake and kingdoms quake. Okay, he has a military arsenal that, that causes some serious damage in the earth. Fire, a flood of fire, even causing the earth to reel to and fro as a drunken man. In, um, I believe that's in Isaiah 33. Yet for all this, his anger is not abated. His hand is upraised still. So this is the time when Heavenly Father allows this end time person, it's this one that we chose over God to do his thing so that he can open our eyes to choose what's good and eternal and have our hearts turn back to the Lord. And this actually becomes a refrain. It's used at least five times in Isaiah 5 and in Isaiah 10 as this anger, this wrath, just goes on and on. He is the river, and this is a really important one to, to nail down because it, it, you, use, you see it in so many scriptures. The, he is the great and mighty waters of the river in Isaiah 8, the king of Assyria in all of his glory. Okay. All right, so we've linked a few things together. So we have some pseudonyms and some metaphors that tell us about the king of Assyria in the end time. Let's look at Isaiah's depiction of Egypt in the end time. What kind of a power is Egypt in the end time? Is Egypt stronger than Assyria? An elite world power that is sliding into decline is what we see about Egypt. It is industrious but suffering economic woes. It is politically stable but rapidly deteriorating. Religious but turning to worshiping idols. These are all phrases pulled out of Isaiah. Having fertile lands, but adverse weather. That adverse weather is interesting. We're going to take a look at that in a minute. Possessing a strong military, but relying on the arm of flesh against Assyria. All right. And that was forbidden in the Old Testament. God wanted us to rely on him. He is our deliverer. He is our salvation, not our armies and our military. Now let's address the code name Egypt and observe the way Egypt is depicted as a great superpower of the ancient world. The ministers of Noth have been foolish. This is in Isaiah 19. That was part of our reading last night because it's all about Egypt. The officials of Noth deluded. Now if we're going we're gonna to see in just a minute, if we go into Isaiah Illustrated, for instance, we can get a definition of zone and Noth, and we find that that would be similar to Washington, D.C., the uh, political centers of Egypt in the ancient metaphor. The heads of state have, been led, have led Egypt astray. Jehovah has permeated them with a spirit of confusion. They have misled Egypt in all that it does, causing it to stagger like a drunken to his vomit. And there shall be nothing the Egyptians can do about it. Neither head nor tail, that's talking about leaders of the, of the society or the culture, down to the common uh, civilians, palm, top, or reed. In that day, it's our code name for the day of the Lord, the end time 
apocalyptic scenario, the Egyptians will be as women fearful and afraid of the brandishing hand Jehovah of hosts wields over them. All right, here is just a picture really quick of the page in Isaiah Illustrated where you can look at chapter 19. The comments will be over on the right and then you can have some dialogue right there showing you that zone and Nav would be similar to Washington DC or other political centers. And this is what I recommend. For those that don't want to read Isaiah Illustrated cover to cover with all of the comments by every verse, when you struggle with a verse, when you don't get what a verse is saying, that's when you go to your study guide. That's when you go to Isaiah Illustrated and you start reading the comments that are about those verses and that will be very, very helpful in understanding these these types and these symbols and these these Hebrew literary techniques that Isaiah uses throughout the book. But if you want to know who Egypt is, it's nailed down completely in a Book of Mormon in Ether chapter 13 verses 6 through 8. And there, and that a nation should be built upon this land. What land were they on? This was our land. This was North America and the Americas. A new Jerusalem will be built upon this land unto the remnant of the seed of Joseph, for which things there has been a type. And so here he's going to actually tell us what the type is. For as Joseph brought his father, Joseph of Egypt, brought his father down into the land of Egypt, and so he died there, wherefore the Lord brought Lehi and his family out of the land of Jerusalem, a remnant of the seed of Joseph, that he might be merciful unto the seed of Joseph, that they would perish not. So just as Joseph was brought into Egypt to save his father Israel and their families, the reason the house of Joseph was brought to this land was to be a savior in the end time of the world. And this is a type. Even as God was merciful unto the father of Joseph, that he would perish not. Wherefore the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land, and it shall be a land of their inheritance. And they shall build up a holy city unto the Lord, like unto the Jerusalem of old. And they shall no more be confounded until the end come, when the earth shall pass away. And that's right back to Article of Faith number 10, that Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be built upon this the American continent, one of the most profound pieces of information in the restoration, that there are two scenarios going on, that there is a scenario in America on this, the land of the New Jerusalem, and there is a scenario in Old Jerusalem where they will also build according to Ether 13. Isaiah 19, I will stir up the Egyptians against the Egyptians. They will fight brother against brother and neighbor against neighbor city against city, and state against state. Egypt's spirit shall be drained from within. I will frustrate their plans, and they will resort to idols and to spiritualists and to mediums and to witchcraft. And thank goodness, in the Civil War in the 1860s, America repented. Abraham Lincoln pled with our country. We are both at fault, the North and the South. We are all sinners, and we have to repent, or our nation will be destroyed. I will frustrate their plans, but this time they will resort to idols and spiritualists and to mediums and witchcraft, meaning they don't believe in God anymore. They don't believe in turning to the only source of help. And so when they don't know what else to do, they will turn to alternative sources. Isaiah 31, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, relying on horses putting their trust in immense numbers of chariots and vast forces of horsemen, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor inquire of Jehovah. Yet he too is shrewd and will bring disaster upon them and not retract his words. Okay, just in case we think that we are referring to the civil war in the 1860s there when he's talking about the Egyptians fighting brother against brother and state against state, this is an interview published in, <clears throat> in the Millennial Star and the, reported in the Deseret News in 1878. Okay, so this is over 10 years after the Civil War is over. And David Whitmer is being interviewed about the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. Where are the plates now? This is Orson Pratt and Joseph F. Smith interviewing him. 
in a cave where the angel has hidden them up until the time arrives when the plaints, which are sealed, shall be translated. God will yet raise up a mighty one who shall do his work till it is finished and Jesus comes again. When will the temple be built at independence? Right after the great tribulation is over. Well, what do you mean by that? A civil war more bloody and cruel than the rebellion. It will be a smashing up of this nation about which time the second great work has to be done. A work like Joseph did. The translation of the rest of the Book of Mormon, the sealed place, and the peace all over. So that, we wouldn't call that doctrine, but we would find it fascinating that David Whitmer was taught these things and believed these things about the coming forth of the sealed plates. So let's just kind of compare this to scripture and to Isaiah. He will rise up against the brood of miscreants and the allies of evildoers. The Egyptians are human, not divine. Their horses are flesh, not spirit. When Jehovah stretches out his hand, I should have highlighted that one, <laughs> and those, all of those helped will fall. Both shall come to an end together. Now, in Isaiah 20, kind of 19 and 20 go together as chapters on Egypt and prophecies of Isaiah's end time Egypt, the world superpower that is a nation in decline. Then Jehovah said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and a portent against Egypt and Cush, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush, both young and old, naked and barefoot. And that's a very uh, common thing in, in Hebrew prophecy, that the prophet acted out what would happen. And Isaiah is going to be end up being um, hunted down and, and chased and, and uh, eventually his life taken by, um, by a wicked king in his day. And he actually was naked and barefoot prophesying for three years as a sign that Assyria was going to come and destroy. That is a type, it says in the next verse, for us. It says, both young and old naked will be taken captive, naked and barefoot with their buttocks uncovered to Egypt's shame. Men shall be appalled and perplexed at Cush, their hope, and at Egypt, their boast. In that day shall the inhabitants of the isles say, what has become of those we looked up to? On whom will we rely for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria? How shall we ourselves escape? So again, verse, verse um, 3 is where we get the idea that there will be a servant that will come to Egypt and that he will prophesy for three years to warn them to turn back to the Lord and to repent. Do you notice how Isaiah characterizes Egypt as a failing state, weakened from within, leading to civil war, and an invasion by God's hand of punishment from the king of Assyria or Babylon? Egypt's mighty military, to which the lesser nations of the world looked for protection, excuse me, well, <clears throat> looked for protection against Assyria's aggression, proves to be but an arm of flesh. Can you discern possible parallels already developing between the world's ancient superpower and the world's superpower today, so that the name Egypt could act as a code name for America. And if not, then who is it a code name for? If Isaiah's characterization of Egypt indeed parallels the course of America is on, wouldn't that serve as a wonderful warning to those who perceive Egypt to be a prophetic name for America? But that isn't all. Egypt's inhabitants are destroyed or taken captive by the king of Assyria or Babylon. But Israel's God delivers certain covenanters in the land of Egypt. So let's take a look at this particular part of the prophecy, that there are both people who repent. There are people in Egypt that turn back to the Lord and fulfill a mission at that time. But in order to do that, let's first go back and take a look at the vision of George Washington that he reportedly had at Valley Forge. This is an account that was given by a gentleman named Anthony Sherman, 
who was supposedly at Valley Forge at the winter of 1777, 1778. They've had a hard time substantiating um, the actual details of the loca location of the vision. Um, apparently, Anthony Sherman um, didn't report this vision that he witnessed um, from George Washington until his deathbed. And so there's, there's a memory um, a memory thing going playing into this vision that, that we know because a couple of his details don't match up. But if you look at the vision that he's telling you about, that he's remembering, it is so prophetic and so accurate that no matter whether he got all of his details exactly right or not, this vision was a prophecy in and of itself that it was told in the 1880s when it was reported. And again, I heard the mysterious voice say, Son of the Republic, look and learn. Now, again, because he's already seen in the vision, and for lack of time, I've only put in the last stage of it, in the first one, he, in the first time the angel told him to look and learn, it was the Revolutionary War. And the second time, it was our Civil War in the 1860s. And the angel is not reporting all of the wars that will America will be involved in. They're prophesying, he's prophesying the wars that will be on this land, on this soil. And so this one that we're about to read is the one that hasn't been fulfilled yet. All the other ones have, in amazing detail. Son of the Republic, look and learn. At this, the dark, shadowy angel placed a trumpet to his mouth and blew three distinct blasts. Now, I don't know who Anthony Sherman was, but right there we have a Hebrew prophecy. The Day of Trumpets, there are three distinct blasts that are blown. They are called the Shevarim, and they are broken cries of God's people calling out to the Lord. And the angel took water from the ocean and he sprinkled it on Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene. From each of these countries arose thick black clouds that were soon joined into one. Throughout this mass there gleamed a dark red light by which I saw hordes of armed men who were moving in the cloud, marching by land and sailing to America by sea. Our country was enveloped in the volume of the cloud. And I saw these vast armies devastate the whole country, burn up the villages, towns, and cities that George Washington had beheld springing up far into the future from the time he lived. As my ears listened to the thundering of the cannon and the clashing of the sword and the shouts and the cries of millions in mortal combat, I heard again the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. When the voice had ceased, the dark shadowy angel placed his trumpet once more to his mouth and blew a long, fearful blast. On the day of trumpets, the long, fearful blast, the Tekia Kodala, Kodola, is the, called the Great Blast, and it is the one that announces the coming of the king on the Feast of Trumpets. Instantly, a light as of a thousand suns shone down from above me and pierced and broke into fragments the dark cloud which enveloped America. At the same moment, the angel upon whose head still shone the word union, and who bore our national flag in one hand and a sword in the other, descended from the heavens, attended by legions, and if you needed to review that and look that up, in Rome that was 3,000 to 6,000 men, but in general it applies to a vast host of, of, of armies, attended by legions of white spirits. These immediately joined the inhabitants of America, who I perceived were nigh overcome, but who immediately taking courage again, closed up the broken ranks and renewed the battle. I call this Ephraim's battle at the gate in America. Again, amid the fearful noise of the conflict, I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. As the voice ceased, the shadowy angel for the last time dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it upon America. Instantly, the dark cloud rolled back together with the armies it had brought, leaving the inhabitants of the land victorious. Now, I'm going to depart from Washington's vision for just a minute and do a little bit of piecing together that I've done. I don't claim that it's the accurate uh, interpretation of what happened here, but I ask myself the question, what causes the armies to pack their bags and go home? 
And there is in scripture something that sounds similar to that. We're going to go and take a look at it in Daniel. But I always tell all of my students, guys, if you believe something because I tell it to you, then you fail the class. You have to go in your scriptures. You have to come to your own conclusions. I'll share with you my thoughts, but this must come from you. Daniel 11. Notice what happens between the king of the north and the king of the south here in Daniel. Um, a few verses earlier, the vile person stood in verse 21, and he comes and he attacks the king of the south and has a huge victory <coughs> on the king of the south and destroys the army at that time. But then in verse 29 it says, And at the time appointed, and that means in Hebrew the Moed, the time appointed, like we have appointed a time for Thanksgiving. We have a feast. We get together. Everybody kind of knows when to gather for an appointed time. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south. But it won't be as the former, uh, as the latter time. For the ships of Chetim, which are associated in, in the New Testament as the maritime powers of the Mediterranean coastlands, okay, the ships of Chetim shall come against him, and therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, shall take away the daily sacrifice, and shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. So as I've read Daniel 11, and, and, and of course it had its classical or historical fulfillment. They can show in detail how Daniel 11 came to pass. But remember, Daniel is having a vision of the end time. And so all of these things play out again. Is it possible that when the battle is at the gate for the new Jerusalem, old Jerusalem makes a counterattack and the king of Assyria has to withdraw to attack them? When the house of Judah and the house of Joseph will stand together and fight for God and for freedom in the end time, Okay, something fascinating that's going on with Daniel. Just to bring your attention to, this is just another, just another fingerprint of God, just another testimony of these end time events and, how, and God prophesying to us the, what our roles are in this end time scenario. Daniel was originally, it had Hebrew chapters, chapters that were written in Hebrew. And that would have been the end chapter, chapters 8 through 12, and the first chapter. If you kind of look at the events that happen in those chapters, you find that Daniel is making a chiastic prophecy by chapter to Israel in chapters 1 and 8 through 12. In chapter 1, we notice that they are not defiled with the king's meat. And just now, we read some verses in Daniel 11, there's some bigger ones in Daniel 12, that where they're not defiled. No matter if it's to the death, they will stand and they will be wise and their robes will be made white during the tribulation, and they're not defiled. So that's kind of the, the, the framework at the beginning and the end. The two chapters in the center of the Hebrew chapters are that Messiah, the prince, comes and strengthens Daniel and tells him during this tribulation, be strong, and he strengthens him. If you go to the center where the main message usually can be found in a chiastic type literary structure, the fierce king is broken without hand, which is exactly what Isaiah says, and the vile person comes to his end. We're going to take a look at that battle in Old Jerusalem in just a minute. But for a minute, let's go back and look at the other chapters. Daniel's chapters 2 through 7 were written originally in Aramaic. In the Aramaic language was the language of the nations in Daniel's time. So these are the chapters that present a prophecy to the Gentiles, to the nations in the end time. In chapters 2 and 7, those are always your title chapters, the ones on the two extremes, they frame the prophecy. We see 
King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of that statue. Do you remember the big stone that rolls and crushes the statue? And then in Daniel 7, he sees a vision of the four Gentile kingdoms. So this particular prophecy that we're looking at right now is a prophecy about the kingdoms that will be broken. If we go to chapters 4 and 5, in the center, we see that we have the dream of the tree that represents Babylon that gets cut down. And then you have, in chapter 5, the writing on the wall that prophesies the destruction of Babylon. So what is going on? We've got the nations being represented, and we've got their destruction being prophesied. But what's happening in the middle? What's happening in chapters 3 and 6? There you find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being saved out of the fire, and Daniel being saved out of the lion's den. I find so much comfort and joy in, in, in the literary structures that are so embedded in all scripture. Now let's return back to Washington's dream and then we're going to look at these battles in the New Jerusalem and Old Jerusalem in Isaiah. Okay? Then once more I beheld the villages, towns, and cities springing up where I had seen them before, while the bright angel, planting the azure standard he had brought in the midst of them, cried with a loud voice, while the stars remain, and the heavens ascend down dew upon the earth, so long shall the union last. And taking from his brow the crown on which blazoned the word union, he placed it upon the standard while the people, kneeling down, said, Amen. All right, Isaiah 19. In that day there shall be an altar erected to Jehovah in the midst of the land of Egypt. You guys ever seen where Jackson County is in the middle of North America? Right in the center, in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a monument to Jehovah at its border. They shall serve as a sign and a testimony of Jehovah of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to Jehovah because of the oppressors, he will send them a savior who will take up their cause and deliver them. Jehovah will make himself known to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians shall know Jehovah in that day. They will worship by sacrifice and offerings and make vows to Jehovah and fulfill them. Jehovah will smite Egypt and by smiting heal it. They will turn back to Jehovah and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. All right, so let's take a look at the, a couple of scriptures that talk about this battle that George Washington saw in vision when America is attacked on her own soil. In that day shall Jehovah of hosts be a crown as a crown of beauty and a wreath of glory as to the remnant of his people, to the remnant, the ones that are left, a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and a source of strength to those who repulse the attack at the gates. And in Isaiah 30, at the voice of Jehovah, the Assyrians will be terror stricken. They who used to strike with the rod at every sweep of the staff of authority, when Jehovah lowers it upon them, they will be fought in mortal combat. Okay, that is when the remnant stands for Jehovah on this land. We're going to take a look in just a minute of what happens in old Jerusalem and how that battle is different. All right, so let's take a minute now and look how Heavenly Father describes the New Jerusalem, how he describes Zion on the American continent in Isaiah. Isaiah 59, But he, Jehovah, will come as a redeemer to Zion, to those of Jacob who repent of transgression, says Jehovah. Remember our cycle. There is apostasy and judgment, then restoration and salvation. We are in need of repentance in Egypt. Isaiah chapter 1, for Zion shall be ransomed by justice, those of her, her who repent by righteousness. And in Isaiah 51, I will put my words in your mouth and shelter you in the shadow of my hand. That's the other hand. That's the right hand. We're going to see more about these pseudonyms that are the same for the good guy and the bad guy, showing an arch rivalry between them. While I replant the heavens and set the earth in place, that I may say to Zion, 
you are my people. And I love those words because we're going to learn next, next class that when God calls you his people, that's a special covenant and a special promise. Jehovah is comforting Zion, bringing solace to all her ruins. He is making her desert like Eden, her desert as the garden of Jehovah. Joyful rejoicing takes place there, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Isaiah chapter 4. Over the whole site of Mount Zion and over its solemn assembly, Jehovah will form a cloud by day and a pillar of fire um, by night. And I'm quoting Deuteronomy now, back, or, or the Exodus when they, when they came out of Egypt there. But it's here, it's in a mist glowing with fire by night. Above all that is glorious shall be a canopy. That canopy is important. And it shall be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a secret refuge from the downpour and from the rain. So there's our inclement weather, our bad weather, but it's very, very symbolic. And we're going to see in just a minute where that bad weather is coming from. All right, DNC 45. And with one heart and with one mind, gather up your riches that ye may purchase an inheritance which shall hereafter be appointed unto you. I'm so grateful that the promised land has been purchased. And they'll be on the scene when it's redeemed. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall also be there, and so much that the wicked will not come unto it, and it will be called Zion. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take up his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. Now take that imagery, take that imagery of the Shekhanah, the glory of God, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and compare that protection to what's going on in Babylon in Isaiah. And we're going to do more lessons on Babylon and, and de detail this out more. But for today, we're just going to take a few verses. An oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah saw, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw in vision. The day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, shall come as a cruel outburst of anger and wrath those code names right there, to make the earth a desolation, that sinners may be annihilated from it. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to pay really close attention to Isaiah's description of Babylon. Note the words that are underlined there, the earth and the world, okay? By this time, Babylon is all over the planet, just like the children of Israel are scattered everywhere. But Heavenly Father is detailing who the, he's talking about when he speaks of Babylon. He's talking about sinners. He's talking about the wicked, insolent men, tyrants all over the earth and the world in these verses. We're actually going to do a, a lesson on what we're going to call the Babylon umbrella in Isaiah, where he actually does a literary structure and defines exactly who Babylon is in the last days, that it's all over the world. But that's going to be for another lesson. For now, just notice this. Babylon, the most splendid of kingdoms, the glory and pride of the Chaldeans shall be thrown down as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Now think for a minute how Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Babylon will be destroyed in the last days in the same way. The terms, therefore, characterize Babylon as both a people and a place. A place that becomes so evil it resembles Sodom and Gomorrah which God utterly leveled by a rain of fire and brimstone. Think, think, any scriptures about hail and fire? When Isaiah says of Zion that God will form a cloud by day and amidst glowing with fire by night, that this will act as a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day, a secret, a secret refuge from the downpour and from the rain, isn't that an invitation to contrast what happens to Zion with what happens to Babylon? What kind of heat of the day and downpour and rain do you suppose that Isaiah is alluding to when God protects Zion at the same time that Babylon is destroyed in the day of the Lord? You were a refuge for the poor, a shelter for the needy in distress, a covert from the downpour and a shade from the heat. When the blast of tyrants beat down like torrents against the wall, or like scorching heat in the desert, 
You quelled the onslaughts of the heathen as burning heat by the shade of a cloud. You subdued the power of tyrants. All right. Therefore, thus saith my Lord, the Lord of hosts, O my people who inhabit Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians. Though they strike you with the rod or raise their staff over you, as they did the Egyptians. Now in this case, we have some people here who are left out in the attack. There were a group of people, the elect, that were called out and gathered out in Isaiah, but there's also a group of people who didn't come when the call was made. And they're kind of stuck out here in this attack, but they are repenting and they're turning back to the Lord. And so we're gonna watch this in, in Isaiah. Having seen that all is not lost for Egypt, but that God's eternal designs are at work to heal and deliver a righteous category of the Egyptians, now let us turn our attention to Assyria. Compare the way Isaiah characterizes Assyria as its king, also called the king of Babylon, which historically was a title that Assyrian conquerors of Babylon applied to themselves. Although we have already observed passages that describe the king of Assyria, or Babylon, note how those below round out Isaiah's characterization of a tyrannical world conqueror whom Israel's God subdues in the end. So we're going to turn to Isaiah 8. That was another one of our chapters that we read in preparation for these verses. My Lord will cause to come over them the great and mighty waters of the river, the king of Assyria, in all his glory. So you've got river and king of Assyria in a direct parallel here. And again, we're just going to keep paralleling these pseudonyms, and we're going to come up with a whole bunch of code names for the king of Assyria. He will rise up over all his channels and overflow his banks. He will sweep into Judea like a flood and pass through, reaching the very neck. His outspread wings will um, will span the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Through nation, though nations form packs, they shall be routed. Give heed, all you distant lands. You may take courage in one another, but shall be in fear. You may arm yourselves, but shall be terrorized. So trusting in Egypt to protect the world is not going to be a good plan. In Isaiah 10, he advances on Aeth, and he passes through Migron. At Michmash, he marshals his weaponry. They cross over the pass, stopping overnight at Giba. Rama is in a state of alarm. So what we want to imagine here is if you're in Utah, let's say that we're in Salt Lake City, then, then there they are. They're, they're, they're coming down from Idaho, and they're crossing that border there. And now they're, they're in Logan, and, and they're getting closer. They're in, they're in Ogden. They're, they're, they're right outside of Salt Lake City. They're, they're in Cottonwood Canyon. That would be Nob. That's the same day he will but pause at Nob and signal the advance against the mountain of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Isaiah 14. Jehovah, Jehovah of hosts made an oath, saying, As I foresaw it, so shall it happen. As I planned it, so shall it be. I will break Assyria in my own land and trample them underfoot on my mountains. That is a clue that what we're talking about here, this anciently was the actual king of Assyria coming to the walls of Jerusalem, shaking his fist and making torture threats to the soldiers on the wall. We're going to read about that in Isaiah 37 and 38. But just like then, when he said to King Hezekiah, stay faithful, when he said to the people, be faithful, it was in his own land. Now, this is a satellite photographic image taken by Vendel Jones and discovered, and, and he is showing in this image that the shadows of the mountains in Jerusalem form Hebrew alphabet letters. And if you look right where Jerusalem is on this map. You can see the Hebrew letters Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. That's Jehovah. That's his name on the land. And look right over there in Ephraim with the borders of the land of Ephraim, there are the letters, the Aleph, 
the pay, the resh, and the letters that spell out Ephraim on the mountains of Israel. Were this the holy name of Jehovah, the only inscription seen on the ridges in the land of Israel, one might say that that was sufficient. Deenu, praise God. At that moment each day in Hashem's time, the quill of the sun dips silently into the inkwell of shadows between the hills and inscribes his name on the land. Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 and 6. But unto the place where the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shall thou come to bring your offerings to the Lord. All right, that land, that land where the king of Assyria is broken is Israel. It is an old Jerusalem. Their yoke shall be taken from them, their burden removed from their shoulders. These are the things determined upon the whole earth. For is the hand upraised, for this is the hand upraised over all nations. For what Jehovah of hosts has determined, who shall revoke? When his hand is upraised, who will turn it away? Now he's going to tell us who's going to turn it away. We're going to look at that battle in just a second. In that day, Jehovah gives you relief from grief and anguish and from the arduous servitude imposed upon you. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say, How the tyrant has met his end and tyranny ceased. Jehovah has broken the staff of the wicked, the rod of those who ruled him with unerring blows, and struck down the nations in anger and subdued the peoples in his wrath by relentless oppression. Now the whole earth is at rest and peace. And there is jubilant celebration. And here's the battle. Here's the new Passover at Jerusalem. And this is different from Ephraim. When we take the battle to the gate and the angels of heaven join us in the fight, in the last stand for liberty and God and family in the earth. This is Jerusalem. For thus says Jehovah to me, as a lion or a young lion growls over his prey, when the shepherds muster in full force against him and is not dismayed at the sound of their voice, nor daunted by their numbers, so shall Jehovah of hosts be. When he sends, now this is both battles, look here, to wage war upon Mount Zion and upon its heights. But look how it's different at Jerusalem. As birds hover over the nest, so will Jehovah, Jehovah of hosts guard Jerusalem and by protecting it he will deliver it and by passing over it he will preserve it and Assyria shall fall by the sword a sword not of man a sword not of mortals shall devour them before that sword they will waste away and their young men melt and their captain shall expire in terror, and their officers shrink from the ensign. They who surrounded Israel, and with the intent to annihilate God's covenant people, says Jehovah, whose fire is in Zion, and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. You can read more about that battle, that battle of Armageddon in, in, the, uh, in Zechariah as well. All right. So we can see that the end time, there's code names, there's Zion and Babylon, and these are two spiritual opposites in the end time prophecies. And then we see Assyria and Egypt. These are two political superpowers in opposition to each other in the end time prophecies. It's very, very enlightening and fun to go through your scriptures. In all of my classes, I ask the students, to get a yellow pencil and a gray pencil and a green pencil and go through in the new translation of Isaiah by Avraham Yiliadi, he has bold words. The bold words are the metaphorical pseudonyms for these different characters. And you have to read them in context to know which one is which. But you'll find that you start to figure it out. There's a servant that rises to stand, that deliverer that Isaiah says that God will send to Egypt that to deliver them and to warn them for three years. That that servant, we, I like to highlight him in yellow, and just go with me. I picked these colors 
for a lot of different reasons, but um, you can choose whichever colors you want. The ones that I use are yellow for the servant, and I use a gray for the tyrant. If you use a soft leaded um, pencil, like I like to use so that I don't tear up my scriptures, um, you can take a black, uh, pen, a black Prismacolor pencil and you can just color really lightly and you can get that gray shade. The only reason I mention that is because you can buy just this simple set for $6.50 online and then you can get these nice soft leaded pencils that won't damage your, your scriptures. Um, and then I like to color green for the Lord. Um, he came in the spring and, and he is the giver of life. And those are just the colors that I chose. And you'll kind of see that coloring scheme in Isaiah Illustrated. So this is a chart in the appendix of Isaiah Illustrated where you can go and you can look up in the gray, you can see all of the metaphorical pseudonyms and the names of the king of Assyria or Babylon that you can mark with your gray in your scriptures. And then you can also go through with your yellow and then mark all of the, the names of the Lord's servant in the last day. And your scriptures will just come alive with all of this stuff that you never even saw before because you just read right over top of those uh, metaphorical pseudonyms. Now, remember that sometimes that the, the words apply to both. So like the hand, we've got the left hand of the hand of judgment of God, and then you've got the right hand, you've got the hand of deliverance. And you, um, you sometimes I even have to color half and half because it goes to both, to both of those. But here again, you have in your in your appendix of Isaiah Illustrated, the a list of the code names and where they're found in Isaiah. Also remember that um, in Isaiah Illustrated, all of those code names are also marked in the text there. You can go there to the, to the different chapters and, and check it out, read the comments if you're not sure who he's talking about and, and kind of get the context of, of those particular verses. Okay, so we're gonna review just a few highlights from, chat. we read chapters eight and 10 and 19 and 20, we're gonna review just a few highlights from those chapters that I, I, we don't wanna pass over and not mention. The first one we need to mention is that Isaiah has a son in chapter eight, and the son is named Meher Shal Hasbaz, and that's a name that in Hebrew means hasten the plunder and hurry the spoil. And I, I often laugh and joke, I mean, that would be a terrible name to give your child, you know? Uh, I choose Mayor Shalazbeth for my team. Hasten the plunder, hurry the spoil. Obviously, these are prophetic names. And there's categories of people that are represented in the end time prophecy by these different sons. Now, for our next class, we're going to pick up chapter 7, chapter 7 and 8. And we're going to see two other sons there. One will be Isaiah's. And then one will be another son that is mentioned there. And these three sons are going to represent three different categories of choices and, and behavior patterns that are going to happen in this end time scenario. So I need you to pay attention to that child and that son that was born in chapter 8. Another really fun thing that we saw in chapter 8 was something that was called word pairing. Okay, that's a Hebrew literary device, and what you do is it, 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 you know, you'll use one word in this verse and then that same word in the next verse, but you'll pick up one word in this, this verse that you'll use the same word in the next verse, and it's kind of like stitching all the verses together from the, from the statement to its conclusion, okay? So, and in this particular set of verses, I didn't put the whole thing up there, you can turn to Isaiah Illustrated to see it, you have in, in verse 12, these people. And then if you go down to the end of this word pairing chain, you're going to say, are taken into captivity. Okay? Well, what's going on in between these people that are taken into captivity? You see that the comment boxes are blue in this particular chapter. That means that we are in the section or the theme of the bifid structure of rebellion and compliance. Okay? So what you've got here is you have some people rebelling and some complying. So here we have, be not afraid or awed by the conspiracies that these people are afraid of. I mean, we have a direct warning here from Isaiah that there is going to be conspiracy theories that are disinformation, that they are actually putting out a conspiracy theory to give disinformation to cover up what's really going on. So he says, don't be afraid of man. Don't be afraid of this conspiracy theories. And then he says down here, but sanctify the Lord of hosts, making him your fear and him your awe. Keep your focus on the mark. Because that's the only thing that's going to help you sort all of this. And you're going to see through this word pairing 
that they're making choices. Here in verses 11 through 15 of chapter 8, it's highlighting the theme of rebellion and compliance. Some of the people fear and awe man, which is a conspiracy there, and some of these people fear and awe the Lord, and he becomes a sanctuary for them. Reading between the lines, we learn that the present ways of the Lord's people are leading them to captivity. That conclusion could be taken both as a principle based on the idea of cause and effect and as an outright prediction that captivity is coming. All right, so you can watch a lot of interplay here. And now we're going to take a little bit of a, a, a rabbit trail because I think this is, um, this is an issue that might be a stumbling block for some people. I've heard it taught many, many times that outer darkness, outer darkness is the second death. It is that place where you get, you, you go if you refuse ultimately to repent. And in Isaiah and in other scriptures, that is not what it is represented as. So we're going to look at verse 22 in chapter 8. It says that they, those people that are left out when all this destruction is coming, will look to the land, but there will be a depressing scene of anguish and gloom, and they will be banished into outer darkness. So what does that mean? Does that mean that they get sent to hell? What's going on here? Um, if, if you run and you link those words through scripture, you can, you'll can you find that those that um, are called to the wedding, um, some of them come in and they go into the sanctuary and others are left out. The door is shut and the scriptures say that they are in outer darkness because they rejected the light when it came. And so we're starting to get an image here that the people that are in outer darkness are the ones that refused the warning and the light when it came, and they got left in Isaiah out in this time of destruction. And this kind of parallels what it says in Alma chapter 40 about outer darkness. So let's take a look at it there. And then it shall come to pass that the spirits of the wicked, yea, who are evil, for behold, they have no part or portion of the spirit of the Lord. For behold, they chose evil works rather than good. Therefore the spirit of the devil entered into them, took possession of their house, and they are cast out into outer darkness. And this because of where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and this because of their own iniquity. And they are led captive by the will of the devil. So what we have here is we have a picture in Alma of those that are in outer darkness are the ones that are led captive by the devil. Now one thing to remember about this time in the day of the Lord, in the time of Isaiah's prophecies, that John the Revelator in chapter 12 says that Satan is cast to the earth during this time. So there's mighty angels coming down fighting for Zion, but there are also demons taking a stand for Satan in, at this time. And he is leading people captive at this time. So it kind of fits that definition of Alma. And how long does he lead them captive? It says that when the thousand years are expired. So let's compare what the second death is compared to this outer darkness in scriptures. It says that when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed. And that at that time, at the great white throne judgment that we see in Revelation 20, the devil is cast into a lake of fire. Okay, And those that don't choose to follow him, the NC 88 that choose to follow Michael and his armies at that time, are written in the books of life. Okay, and they're not cast. But at that time, death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That is at the end of the millennium. And this becomes super important theologically in what's going on here at the time of the king of Assyria and, and the destruction that's happening in the last days. In the ancient Egyptian documents, the Pista Sophia, there, it talks about that there's a constant remixing going on in the universe. And I love this description, in which the old, worn out, contaminated substances, the refuse of worn out worlds and kingdoms, is first thrown out onto the scrap heap and then returned to chaos as dead matter, melted down in a dissolving fire for many years, by which all the impurities are removed from it and by which it is improved and ready to be poured from one kind of body into another again. And I love this when we think about the lake of fire that it's talking about, where death and hell and Satan and those that refuse to repent are cast. I'm going to bump through these scriptures really fast. These are just a whole bunch of scriptures that talk about the second death being the lake of fire and brimstone. 
um, from Revelation 21, DNC 76, Jacob 3, Alma 12. It's very consistent throughout Scripture. But when I read this in the Old Testament Studies by Hugh Nibley, um, it's from page 182, and again, he's, he's referring to the Pistol Sophia. This image was just so beautiful to me when I imagine the great archangels that are so full of love that they would supervise this kind of a work. This is fascinating to me. The whole process by which souls as well as substances are thrown back into the mixing is under the supervision of Melchizedek, the great reprocessor, the purifier and preparer of worlds. He takes the refuse of defunct worlds or souls and under his supervision, five archeons, or mighty angels, process or literally need it, separating out its different components, each one specializing in particular elements which they thus recombine in unique and original combinations so that no new world or soul is exactly like any other. I just, I just even, even in the second death, God is watching over and purifying and reconstructing. And I just find that beautiful. All right, so in the end time, one of the first things to occur in Isaiah's end time drama is the king of Assyria. So everybody says, well, what's coming next? What can we look for? Well. He's one of the first things. It is the darkest time in the world's history because he serves as God's instrument for destroying a corrupt and dysfunctional humanity. His coming heralds the end of the world and the end of Babylon. So here again at this time period, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his own soul? Jesus over and over again is going to say during this time, be true, no matter what, be faithful. Stand in the storm. The day of Jehovah, in Second Peter, will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements melt with the fervent heat of all the, the, the warfare and destruction that's going on there. But does the Lord come as a thief? What are these verses saying? Let's take a look at who the thief is. The Lord is never the thief. That's a clue. I just colored it gray for you. Okay. And, oh, by the way, this one is from Isaiah 10. This is the king of Assyria. Listen to what he says. I have impounded the wealth of the peoples like a nest. I have gathered up the whole world as one gathers abandoned eggs. And if I finish that, it was said, and not one of them made a peep. He's the thief. He comes at the same time as this big grand finale comes. He's the thief that comes in the night. Do you see 106? And again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore, gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light, and that day will not overtake you as a thief. Jesus is going to give us a little bit more of a picture of a thief that we're going to take a look at because I think it's so important that we understand that he, the king of Assyria, is the thief. He's the wrath. He's the hand that judges and the wicked destroy the wicked. And God allows it because their cup of iniquity is full. He's called them to repentance. He sent the prophets. He's warned them and they've killed them and they've cast them out. And they're persecuting the saints. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. Now, in the end time, kids have asked me, how do, how do we tell who's of the house of Israel and who's of the nations, who's of the Gentiles? And I tell them all the time, it's really very simple. Jesus said it in 3 Nephi 16, my sheep hear my voice. When he calls, if you come, you're his sheep. So we all want to be his sheep. But when you do a study on sheep, and you can find some disconcerting things about sheep that very, very much apply to us. It was a very good metaphor for the Lord to use for his people. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He says, I am the good shepherd. Now, in uh, one of my favorite little books uh, called All We Like Sheep by Mary Peoples, it tells a story where um, about the sheep and, and in Israel, what the sheepfold, the Basra that we saw in uh, Micah, that things about the sheepfold that we in, in our culture today might not be as familiar with. 
the first thing that she brings out is that the animals, um, sheep, have to be watched constantly. They have to be watered, they have to be fed, they have to be checked on occasionally, and um, they're not like cows or other herd animals where you can take care of them, feed them, send them out to pasture, and then just herd them home at the end of the day. The shepherds actually have to stay with them and they have to keep them all the day long. Um, she also brings out that the greatest leaders that we have in biblical history were shepherds. That there's an element of schooling that they receive in learning to constantly care for sheep that is very similar to how Father in Heaven watches over his people constantly. David knew from the experiences that he had as a shepherd um, that he, they needed full-time companionship from their shepherd and he wrote one of the most beautiful songs, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So that imagery is all throughout scripture. But in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I am the door. Have you ever wondered why Jesus said he was a door? Well, if you look at the ancient sheepfolds, there was no door. There was just a gap. And shepherds would often bring um, their flocks into these basra, into these sheepfolds, and there would, they would all bring their sheep, and their sheep could get mixed up in this shelter to protect them at night. So in the morning when they would come out, they would have to call their sheep, and the sheep would have to know which one was their shepherd in order to come. But here, Jesus said that in all the sheepfolds, he is the door. And the shepherd slept in the door so that no sheep would come in or out and no wolf could come in without facing the shepherd first. Listen to what Jesus says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but tries to come up some other way and take the sheep, he's a thief and a robber. But he that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by his name, and he leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus to the, to the people, but they understood not the things that he spoke unto them. So he's going to clarify. Then Jesus came unto them again and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. All right, so this is going to kind of lead us into our next class, Ezekiel 37. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. That's a covenant relationship. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever and ever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So this is a time when God's people gather together to their promised lands, they come under covenant again. And God is their God. And they are his people. And they have one shepherd in an end time scenario. We'll talk about the details of how that happens in the next lesson when we read chapters 7 and 8 and 37 and 38 as we talk about the Davidic covenant. A repeat end time scenario. What we've learned from looking at the code names is that God's people and the nations of the world turned to wickedness. An end time Assyria invades and destroys people's lands. 
and end time Assyria ravages a weakened end time Egypt. God sends his people in Egypt a savior who delivers them. God's penitent people experience a millennial age of peace and the earth assumes a paradisiacal glory and harmony prevails. So-called veiled prophecies, those fulfilled only partially in the past, in reality await an end time fulfillment. Prophecies of a millennial peace don't exist in isolation, but are inseparable from prophecies of a worldwide judgment. World powers called by ancient names are types of modern world powers who fulfill similar roles as the one in the past. But in summary, God's got this. It was a plan for them from the beginning to gather his sheep and to make all things new in one for a millennial reign where he, the rightful king, will take possession again of this earth.